I think the key here is that when one starts to understand like, gosh, I'm really drawn to this thing, that when you understand that one can start making, uh, taking steps to, to move away from it. Now, the problem with this whole dopamine thing in the context of relationship is that early on, it's incredibly intoxicating to the point where oftentimes people don't realize that they're veering so hard, right? That, that you know, and, and this is where the, the power of friends um, comes in very handy. This is also where we can honestly say that the power of complete and total disclosure about relationship to friend or therapist is really healthy. If you're saying like, you know, I've seen this with some of my male friends. I have female friends too, but most of my friends just happen to be male at this stage of life. That's just kind of my surroundings. And I get the friend that's super excited about somebody and they'll tell you this story about how this, say, oh, you know, and, and there was this crazy thing. She did this crazy thing and they get kind of uh -huh. wide eyed and like, that doesn't sound good. And he's like, excited about it. I'm like, okay, this is, this is your, this is his drug, right? It's uncertainty. It's excitement. And I, and it follows a very predictable pattern where in three to six months, it's him complaining that she's crazy or that the relationship is a mess or that, you know, the original thing you love now you hate. <laughs> exactly. There's chaos. So I think that here's the, I think the takeaway for relationships, not just at the beginning, not just in the middle. Um, we can talk about the end in a minute if there is one, but to have an awareness where if you sense too much excitement in yourself or too much anticipation mm. of how great someone is, I'm not saying don't fall in love, but be very cautious about the extremes of dopamine. Be very wary about the thing that makes you feel incredible. And I, I say this with some trepidation because I myself, you know, love, love, right? I love, love. Uh, I love, love. Uh, but I love falling in love. It's the best. Love falling in love, love being in love. I mean, that's true in romantic relationships. And I also, you know, I, I love having a bulldog. Like I love Tim. Like you know, love, love. Love, you, you know, uh, I have so many loves in life and, in, and relationships that are always the best of it, right? But there is this element where it is a bit of a drug, right? It's this thing because it's always about more. And if you really want the relationship, if you want good clarity on the relationship and you want it to last, there has to be a tempering of that. And I don't mean um, playing aloof. I don't mean canceling things last minute. I don't mean playing any kind of games, with the dopamine reward prediction error thing. What I mean is just being aware that that chemical state, it, it really is a what comes up comes goes down. And it also puts uh, tremendous demand on the other person, right? Mm -hmm. That I think the key of any good relationship is to be able to toggle back and forth, ideally in parallel, like together through these more dopaminergic, like novelty, excitement, and then the more like really getting joy out of just being together, the more serotonergic stuff, like the, the just like, wow, the sweetness, the, the incredible, like the, the cocoon <laughs> um, and missing one another is super healthy. Also remember, addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring us pleasure, making sure that we continue to derive excitement from other things in life, even when we're falling in love. You know, the concept of the muse and the concept of, in a new relationship there, we feel kind of indestructible and we can do anything in life and feeling so inspired. You know, you see this people be joyful, excited. Oh, I've seen this in family members yeah. also they're like working out again. And you're like, wow, they're using it. But the problem is it's all anchored. It's all tethered to this relationship and the relationship goes and then the rest of stuff goes too. So again, being able to access these motivational reward systems in a bunch right. of contexts, so critical. And then of course we see the opposite too. I have a lot of friends who've been married for a long time. And they're like, yeah, like we never do anything anymore. They're only in that kind of serotonergic. You're going to say we never do it anymore. <laughs> or, or yeah. So, we never do it anymore. and sex is a huge, I mean, it's, we know one thing for sure, which is that all of us are here because either in a dish or in a, well, eventually in a body sperm met egg and develop that, that's just the reality. And that whole process that we call sex, sexual reproduction is strongly anchored to what's called the autonomic arousal system, whereby there's excitement and then, but it can't be too much excitement. It's got to be calm because if it's too much excitement, it actually inhibits the sexual response that, um, believe it or not, the orgasm response in both men and women is driven by the stress system of the body, but it has this positive valence. We say it's a lot of dopamine. And then the why, because then afterwards, whenever that happens to be, there's a 
return to below baseline levels of energy. This is, we think that the just so story about this is that it's likely so that people will exchange smells to pair bond, right? Because pair bonding is pretty vital to human partnership. Um, and obviously people can have sex, not just to raise, to produce and raise young, but then, so the whole like seesawing back and forth, and then it repeats, right? At whatever frequency that couple right. is for them. <laughs> But that whole process is one in which dopamine is strongly released in anticipation and during sex. And, and then afterwards, it plummets. And there's another molecule called prolactin, which skyrockets. Mm -hmm. Prolactin actually sets the refractory period in which, at least for males, sex can't happen again. Mm -hmm. And what are the other things that induce prolactin in males and females? Well, child rearing. La it's linked to the lactation process. Oh wow! Like the 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 like the the coziness thing is not dopaminergic. It's prolactin. It's it's basically driven by prolactin, oxytocin, and serotonin. So this seesawing back and forth is 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 at the core of who we are. It's at the core of how we got here. Mm -hmm. All our parents, one way or another, went through this process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, I always try and think of the exceptions. I'm always teased that I think of every qualified. I suppose in in vitro <laughs> fertilization. The, the mother and the father went through this process in separate areas separate. of the world, but nonetheless, each one went through the process in more standard natural uh, reproduction, as we call it, they took place presumably in the same place. Um, so th this is how we got here. This is how we work. And I think the learning to toggle back and forth between excitement and anticipation, mm -hmm. but never hitting that absolute extreme excitement is a very useful thing. Don't ever hit the ceiling, ever. In that way, you maintain motivation, you maintain excitement and learn how to toggle back and forth. So is it possible? Because I'm just thinking about myself at times in my life or somebody out there listening. Is it possible to both be so excited and connected that you feel that huge drive and push to like mate and be together and spend time? Or is that um, overly heightened dopamine or state uh, an indication of uh, uh, an unhealthy loop or pattern relationship in two people? Oh, I think it can be healthy. I mean, I think, and also remember, dopamine is a generic molecule. So for instance, this is, if ever there was a, a justification for maintaining a lot of different interests and things that can generate dopamine, here's one. When you're, we talked about before, when you're in a relationship that's really great, you feel more energy to do other things. Mm -hmm. the substrate by which adrenaline is created, et cetera. Um, well, the, uh, the opposite is also true. You know, you imagine the couple and one is doing kind of well in life. They're excited about life. The other one is not. Well, the person who's excited about life is sort of like, is in a position to be more excited about the relationship. You know, if you come home from a great day at work um, or you've got a lot going on, you bring that to the relationship. Mm -hmm. That dopamine bleeds over. It's like, because dopamine is all about possibility. It's like, hey, let's take a vacation this year. Let's, or let's take it. Or it could be a simple thing. Like, let's just take a walk or let's start like going for a swim in the morning or let's, it's all about like, let's create newness, right? So there is a way in which you could, one can leverage different components of life in order to be more excited about the relationship they're in. I think that there's another piece to this, which is, you know, which is, I think what you're asking, correct me if I'm wrong, which is that, you know, if it's, if we're too excited about the relationship, will it inevitably fail? And I think the answer is no. One of the amazing things about love and relationships is that it's really about creating a story in one's mind about the past and what it means and projecting that story forward. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's something that is just incredible, right? That has, that's sure mating is in, sex is involved, but it's not just about that. I always joke, you know, sex is necessary, but not sufficient, right? You need the other elements of, of, and, and one of the amazing things about this thing of love and attachment is that it's not all just chemicals and neurotransmitters. I don't want to give that impression. It's also about this ability to, to write, to mutually write a story. Like we met, there was this, this spark, there was this thing, there was this mutual interest. We made it through this hard thing. We, you know, and the key thing, remember dopamine is about projecting into the future. It is important to not just have plans, but to sort of take that story and project it into an infinite number of sequels, not hmm. just the one blockbuster picture that came out and ended. And now we're just going to kind of sit together and only focus on kids. Although kids are hmm. a whole other separate, beautiful dimension of this. Some people don't want them. And oftentimes people will have them 
thinking that it's going to create, it's going to bring novelty to the relationship. I, can, I know so many people who have gotten divorced about seven or after their kids are about seven to nine years old. I'm like, what is going on here? I think that there are a number of different sort of transitions at that stage where the kids are no longer providing a ton of novelty. They need slightly less caretaking, although still substantial amounts of caretaking. So I think that once one understands how these mechanisms work, you can start to layer them in in ways that meet people's different life requirements. The other thing is the breakup part. I just mentioned this, that did an episode on grieving and breaking of attachments. The brain has a three-part map of all attachments, whether or not it's to a person or to an animal, romantic or non-romantic. We want to know where they are in space. Like literally, are they in Paris right now? Are they here? Where are they? Yeah. Where they are in time? Like, are they present now? When will I see them again? And then there's this attachment map. And those three things are tethered. Think of it like a tripod. They're tethered. When somebody, when we break up or if somebody dies, or if we anticipate that a relationship is going to end, it, the grieving process, we know based on neuroimaging, taps into the reward system and creates a system where we are anticipating the, the reward of love and attachment and connection, but it's never going to come. And that is, it, it's like an overactivation of desire, the desire when we, but with the knowledge that there's nothing right there. If someone passes away, we're sometimes familiar with like turning around, expecting to see them. The brain expects to see them because the brain has seen them every time we've turned around. You know, waking up with the bed empty next to us is incredibly like it's, I mean, we hopefully people experience at least one breakup in their life. I think it's actually a healthy thing to experience that. Maybe you get back together. Don't do it. Don't break up just to do this folks. But, um, but th that feeling of like, God, like it's like this yearning. Well, that's the, the hungry animal or human who's the food is just out of reach. And the grieving process is one of reordering that map to understand, okay, maybe this person is not in their current physical form. They're di they've died. Maybe that person isn't available to us because there's a breakup. Yeah. Understand that the craving is setting up literally a pain in the body. Remember, pain and pleasure are toggling also. It's right. a physical and mental anguish because it's right outside our reach. And even though we cognitively understand mm. that it's not available to us, the body still wants it. And so it takes, you know, I think the current estimates based on imaging and other studies are, it's about 60 days of no contact. That means no text, no scrolling and seeing their social media, no looking at pictures of them, no listening to favorite songs, mm. no selling their shirts or other things. 60 days or so to reset those mechanisms just huh. to get back to kind of neutral, unless it was a terrible relationship, in which case people are celebrating. <laughs> what makes someone have a more emotional breakup than another? Oh, that's a great question. There's a phenomenon called, um, and this is beautiful work done by Mary Frances O'Connor at the University of Arizona. Um, she's written a wonderful book about this. There's something called complex or complicated grief. Hmm. Complex, complicated grief is grief that goes on much longer and it has a kind of more of a depressive like state to it. It's the person who's still talking about the person that they broke up with or that broke up with them a, two years later. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, this is so annoying to friends and family. And yet that person is really in a, in a place of intense, complicated grief. So right. you have to acknowledge that. And oftentimes if someone died, then that complicated grief can extend even longer. Complicated right. grief is um, tends to happen more in people that have poor anxiety and stress coping mechanisms going into the relationship. So, so like are, the anxious attachment or avoidant attachment or something, or more of an anxious attachment? Could be. It could also be that the person just naturally, um, their uh, sort of like idling RPM is higher. We all have this. Like, so for instance, some people move around a lot more just standing around. Um, some people are just you know calmer. Uh, I always like to compare people to animals and bulldog, bulldogs and bulldog breeds, for instance, are incredibly like most of the time, unless there's something to be excited about. If you look at a pit bull type breed or a terrier, they kind of have a lot of- My like, Belgian Malinois. Yeah, exactly. You have a Malinois? Yeah. Amazing.